Grace to you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. I've been with you for the last couple of Sundays. Uh, I retired about 10 years ago from full-time ministry, and I've been serving churches around the area. And it's so great to be here with the Bethlehem family, and especially my family, uh, ben, and, and, uh, Car uh, ben and Gary and the, and the whole clan of kids here. Um, and I'm finishing up my series, a uh, three-part series, on Habakkuk. Uh, Habakkuk is an interesting book. We don't, don't usually hear a lot about Habakkuk. It was actually written 600 years before the time of Christ. And I think it's as relevant today as it was then. You know, the prophet lived in a very uh, conflicted time. There was idolatry and injustice and political unrest. Uh, you know, Christians are not immune to problems. And we heard in the first uh, chapter, the first week, that Habakkuk is really wrestling with God. That's what his name means. And he's questioning God, and he says, where are you, God, in the midst of all these problems? And then the second week, we hear God's answer. He says we have to wait. We talked about what that means for us as Christians. And today, what I want to look at is the final chapter, chapter 3, to talk about what helps us when we're living in a troubled world. You know, this is nothing new to our world. So what is it that God has for us that can help us get through some difficult times? Uh, chapter 3 actually starts out with this verse, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. He's praying to God. So what helps us get through? Well, the first thing is prayer. In verse 2, it says, Lord, I have heard your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. So what do we pray about? Well, first of all, we remember what type of God we have in prayer. Habakkuk is remembering all that God has done. We remember God's character. What is God like? We remember that God is goodness and loyal love and mercy, and compassion, that he's slow to anger, and he's faithful to the people who love him. You know, right now, at Bethlehem, you're going through a Bible study from Exodus 34 with all of these attributes of God. I want to urge you to get into that, because it's great to get into that Word of God and see what God is really like and what that means for our lives. Now, in the second part of verse 2, it says, Lord, I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. But then, renew them in our day. Renew them in our time. Make them known. So he's remembering all that God has done. And then he says, I want you to renew that. So each generation, each people, each um, family group, knows what it's like to have God in their lives, to know his characteristics. Do you know what this is? It's a picture from the Hubble telescope. It's been nicknamed the Eye of God. Uh, we don't really know exactly what it is. I, I've been told it's probably billions of planets. And I look at that and I think, that is the God who created me. He created all this. He created all of the world that we live in with all of the wonders. Today, we, we've been seeing a, a lot of snow around. It's been blowing and ice. And, and as I was sitting at the window and I was watching those snowflakes came down, I was reminded that each snowflake is unique. That's the type of God we have. He created something so magnificent for us, not only our earth, but our whole universe for us. But it isn't just about remembering that. It's also remembering what God has done for us. Remember the way God has helped you in the past. You know, that was a common theme in the Old Testament. Remember the story of the Passover, how God saved his people when they put the, the blood on the doorpost to protect them from the angel of death. And God tells the people, I want you to remember this event. I want you to teach your children from generation to generation what that is all about. That I am a God who saves. 
because I love you, I care about you, and I'm going to shed my blood to save you. And it wasn't only the Passover. You might remember the Ten Commandments were written on stone, so they would remember them. They kept them in the Ark of the Covenant. And then, remember when they go into the Holy Land? They have to pass through the waters. Now they come out of Egypt through the Red Sea, but then God creates another miracle while they're going into the Holy Land. And he parts the Jordan River, which is at flood stage. And they walk through on dry ground into this land God is giving them. And he tells each tribe to pick up a stone. And I can imagine each guy who was chosen said, I'm going to pick up the biggest stone. Now that isn't in the scriptures, but I can just imagine it in my mind. But God tells them to pick up those stones and when they get to the other side, to make a memorial in remembrance of what he has done, how he has brought the people out of slavery, has he protected them for 40 years as they wandered in the wilderness, and now as he brought them in to this holy land that he is going to bless them with. In Ephesians, it says, remember that at that time, this is talking about before we had faith in Christ Jesus, you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenant of the promise. At one point, the people of God were far away, without hope and without God in the world. Before Christ, we were not part of God's family, and we had no hope of eternal life. But then Paul says in 2 Timothy, remember Christ Jesus raised from the dead. That's the most important thing that we can remember. We see all those wonderful attributes of God, but we have to constantly remember that our faith is about Christ Jesus. It's not about us. It's not about what we do. It's about what God did for us. I want to ask you, just kind of as, as a challenge, since we can't gather together this morning as a, a family in the church, I want you to remember some of those God moments. Maybe share them with the people around you. What's your favorite God moment? How has God loved you? How has he cared for you, helped you, guided you, been compassionate to you? How has he been slow to anger? Because remembering what God has done in the past for us helps us deal with the problems of life today. Secondly, we just have to trust God. Trust his faith believing in God's mercy and love, even when we might not see it. Sometimes that's hard to do, but we have so many examples throughout the scriptures. Habakkuk in 3.17 says, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there's no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls. Do you know what this meant for the Old Testament people? This was life and death. There was nothing to eat. But yet, they needed to trust in God, even in the midst of the worst problems. You know, God told the Old Testament people that he wanted, as their tithes, the first fruit offerings. Do you know what that means, first fruit offerings? Uh, I grew up in a time when you couldn't go to the grocery store and just get a watermelon any time of the year. There was a season for watermelon. Oh, they tasted so good. There was a season for strawberries. Oh, they were wonderful. That first corn on the cob tasted so delicious. The first fruits. But it even meant more for the Old Testament people because they had to offer that to God. And if they picked that and they offered it to God, what if something happened? What if there was a storm and knocked down the rest of the harvest? They had to trust. That's what the first fruits was all about. Trusting in God to provide. Jesus told his disciples, and we read about it a moment ago in our gospel lesson, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust in me. Sometimes it's really difficult, and it must have been tremendously difficult for the disciples because he says this right before his death. And he says, trust in me. 
And they see their Lord and Savior, their Master, dying on the cross. They put him in the grave. And in their minds, even though Jesus told them he was going to rise again, they thought, this is it. He's dead. He's gone. And now the authorities are going to come after us. So sometimes we have to just take that moment and not be troubled. Just trust in God to see where the next thing is going to come. In Romans 15, St. Paul tells us, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Isn't that wonderful? When we trust in him, we have joy, we have peace. And it may overflow, that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So you see, trusting God, even in the midst of the worst situations, brings joy, peace, and hope because of that power of the Holy Spirit living in us. Well, the last way might be the hardest. Habakkuk tells us we need to rejoice. Now, rejoicing, as far as the scriptures are concerned, doesn't depend on things or circumstances or people. But rejoicing is about what God is and his character. In Habakkuk 3.18, he says, yet, he's listed off all those things. I don't have any grapes. I don't have any cows. I don't have any sheep. I don't have any corn. I don't... Yet, that's a big statement. That's a big statement of trust. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. Because he knew that that rejoicing was not dependent on the circumstances of life. I will be joyful and God, my Savior. And we have that full revelation of knowing Jesus Christ personally as our Savior. In Romans 5, St. Paul says, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Ah, isn't that wonderful? Through whom we have now received reconciliation. We are now made right with God. And you know what the result of that is? The result is strength. It says the sovereign Lord. This is how Habakkuk ends his three chapters. The sovereign Lord is my strength. You see, when he trusts in God, when he has faith in him, when he rejoices, and when he looks at his character, then he says, I have this strength in me. And, and then he gives this wonderful example. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. Takes me up. So, what helps us live in this society with problems? Remember the past. Remember God's goodness to us. Trust in the present. Putting our faith in God. And rejoice in the future. A life with God now and forever. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful book of Habakkuk. Even though it was written so long ago, it's so relevant to us. We face problems, just like every generation has faced problems. And yet you are there with us. Sometimes that means waiting for you to accomplish what you want. But as we live this life, help us to always remember your character, your characteristics, and then help us to live the people you want us to be, giving us peace and joy and contentment as we place our faith and trust in you alone. In the most precious name of Jesus, all God's people said, Amen. Amen.